All right. Well, welcome to the show, Stephen. Great to have you back. It is good to be with you. Well, we're excited to jump into your new book, and we have to ask, as a flow state scientist, why park terrain skiing as your book, Nar Country? What's going on with this? What's the backstory? The book is on peak performance aging. And if you're not familiar with the science of flow, right? Flow is an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. And if you, the godfather of flow psychology is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he wrote four or five books on sort of flow and creativity and things along those lines. And then like seven books or nine books on adult development and flow's role in adult development. So how we grow up, how we mature, how we become adults, flow goes right through the middle of it. So I've already been working on this. Concurrently, my wife and I run a hospice care dog sanctuary. So we've been doing hospice care for dogs for 20 years, 18 years, and we've had tremendous success with our healing protocol. So for the past 20 years, the question has been, wow, I can, I can take dogs with late stage cancer, heart disease, all kinds of terrible problems that should be dead in a month or two, and we can get four or five more years out of how, so what's going on there is a transfer the humans. All these questions were sort of like floating around in my head, adding up and funny story. Last conversation I had with me, I sent me high passed away during COVID. We had a final conversation. And in that conversation, he said to me, we were talking, it was like one flow junkie to another. And he said, look, man, long story short, he said he, most of his flow, he's lifelong flow junkie, lifelong mountaineer, lifelong rock climber, got a lot of flow in the mountains doing that stuff. And he said to me, he's like, have a backup plan. You don't want to, he's 80, he had a stroke. He could barely get out of bed. He was like, have multiple ways to get into flow as you age. It's so important to peak performance aging. It's so important to successful aging. He had said, have a backup plan. So I had been studying peak performance aging, all these ideas. And long story short, the old theory of aging, what we call the long, slow rot theory, right? All of our mental and physical skills decline over time. There's nothing we do to stop the slide. There's a whole bunch of ton of new work that says, no, 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 that's not true at all. These are all use or lose it skills. And if you never stop using them, you can hang on to them, even advance them far later in life than possible. And some of the like core old ideas, like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. There's all this new research that says, no, no, no. Actually, the older brain changes in really beneficial ways and older dogs are better at learning certain tricks than new dogs. So I took all this stuff that was in the laboratory and mostly in theory. And I said, if these things are true, I should be able to learn incredibly difficult, incredibly challenging physical activity that's supposed to be impossible for anybody over like the age of 40 in my 50s. And I picked park skiing simply because I'm a, I, like, I'm a lifelong skier and my backup plan, like my plan for my old, old age and flow was just keep charging down the mountain. And I realized when talking to Mike, I was like, you know what? The, I'm a big mountain skier. I don't know any park tricks. I didn't know how to do any park skiing. And the only way you get into flow in the big mountains is taking bigger and bigger and bigger risks. And while I might want to do that, that doesn't sound like a great plan for, you know, the end, second half of my life. And I, so I knew if I could teach myself to park ski, if I could get to like intermediate, it would allow me to creatively interpret the whole mountain in really playful and fun ways. And I wouldn't need to always be using risk as a flow trigger. I could use novelty and complexity and all these other things provided I could get like from zero to intermediate. And all the studies said it should be possible. And I figured, I made a list of tricks that was zero to intermediate, right? And I figured if the thing takes me five years, what do I care? It's a backup plan. You know what I mean? I started when I was 53 and I really, I figured I'd finish by like it's 20 tricks, maybe by 60. And that was just fine with me. And what happened was I went zero to 60 in a season. Like I had never learned anything as fast as I learned to park, which was crazy. I'm a bad athlete. I've come over family gifted athletes. I've chased professional athletes around mountains. I know what good athletes look like. I'm a bad athlete. I'm a slow, slow <laughs> learner. I broke your body. I've broken nearly 80 bones, right? And I run a company. I write books. I give lectures. I do all stuff. I'm busy. So I, I figured if it worked for me, I, can't, I was so disadvantaged where I was starting from, might work for other people. At the same time I was running this experiment, my ski partner, who's 20 years younger and was a former sponsored athlete who had walked away from sports because he got injured, had a family, had a career, decided to come back at the same time as I did. And he used the same protocol and he got farther in a season than he'd ever gone before. 
And we went, wow, this is the most amazing pilot study anybody's ever run. It's not real for anything else, but it's a cool ass pilot study. So the next year we came back and we took uh, 20 older adults ages 30 to 68 and used the same protocol. And I, we can talk about the protocol was, we'd use the same protocol and in four days on the mountain, got them very far into park skiing or park snowboarding. That was amazing. And then we stripped out the action sports. Now there are reasons action sports are great for peak performance aging. We can talk about it, but maybe it's not for everybody, right? Just, I don't know why, I don't know what's wrong with you people, but let's just hypothetically say this. And we ran it with 500 in, in class form, 500 different people of all age groups. And the all age groups is important because the studies show we can rock till we drop, but peak performance aging actually starts young. You'd like there's stuff you want to do in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s and 50s. Sure, you could come to it. At, like the data also shows you could show up at like 85, start doing this stuff, and it's going to make your life better, a lot better actually. But there's reasons to start earlier. And so we, we taught all ages. And the goal was to see if we could reverse the typical mindset towards aging, like that the second half of your life is going to be diminished. And there's reasons to do this. In fact, people ask, where does peak performance aging start? I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up by the way and let you guys ask another question. I got excited. But uh, the research shows that the most important place to start is by shifting your mindset towards aging, that a positive mindset towards the second half of your life, like stuff in my life is filled with interesting possibilities, essentially a growth mindset towards aging will produce an additional seven and a half years of health and longevity. In other words, you're 300 pounds overweight and your choice is, do I change my mindset or do I lose weight, which is better for longevity and health? Changing your mindset. I'm a smoker, right? I'm a smoker. And I've been smoking for 30 years. What's better? Quitting smoking or changing your mindset? Changing your mindset. So um, it's really the place you wanted to start. We wanted to see if we'd explode people's perceptions of what was possible in the second half of their lives. And it worked incredibly well without the action sports. There were ways to substitute for the benefits of action sports. So that's the book. The book covers the experiments themselves. And um, I'll stop there and let you guys ask your next question. Well, I think to start, because a lot of our audience isn't really into maybe flow science or even the view on aging. So you talked about a few things there that I like to just give some context around. And first, obviously, when we talk about flow, I think people's minds do go to action sports. But what are some other use cases for flow for those of us who aren't going to be hopping on a park train anytime soon? So and this is a misnomer about flow, and it's 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 both me had to accept me high's fault, and it's my fault probably more than anybody else who should be blamed for this. It's both of us, but we both were action sport athletes, and we were both artists and creatives. So that was what we focused on. But it turns out, like reading is the most common flow state on earth. Conversations between middle managers at work is the second most common flow state uh, on earth. Right, and by the way. For those who don't know, right, we define flow as an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best, but it's anybody, it's being in the zone. It's those moments you get so focused on what you're doing, everything else just fades away, your sense of self, time passes strangely, and all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. Now, we won't go in, I won't go into all the studies behind the amplification, but just so people understand, this isn't, there's some physical amplification, strength increases in flow, fast twitch muscle response increases, uh, our pain sensitivity decreases. So endurance tends to go up. Um, so there's physical stuff that happens, but it's mostly cognitive. So flow amplifies motivation, productivity, creativity, learning, um, empathy, wisdom. All of these core characteristics expand and flow. Um, in fact, even uh, nature relatedness, our ability to see, perceive, and care about the natural world increases in flow. Um, so when you talk about flow as optimal performance, it's first of all, it's biological. Everybody's hardwired for flow. So all of us can get into flow. And, and two, um, it's actually really trainable and not particularly hard to get better at. Uh, so I guess that's two. And uh, three is if you've ever performed at your best, I don't care what you're doing, right? You can, now that research shows that like you can win an athletic competition without flow, but you'll only, you won't win a seven game series. You might win a game kind of thing, right? So you can deliver a great speech, presentation without being in flow, but not consistently. Usually you're going to be doing it. If you're doing anything creative, coders in flow built the internet, right? Gamers in flow built the video game industry. In fact, the, just to give you an idea, 
there are tons of studies on flow and media and studies show that really well-designed web pages, web pages with good flow, pardon the pun, actually can drive you into flow. And, you know, marketers know that, you know, driving people into flow is a great way to sell things and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes on and on and on. At the Flow Research Collective, we're a research and training organization. So on the research side, we study the neuroscience of peak performance, what goes on in your brain and your body sometimes when we're performing at the best. And we do this at people, folks at Stanford and USC and UC Davis and UCLA and a whole bunch of other institutions. And then we take what we learn and we use it to train people. We train people in 130 countries. So this is global. And everybody from most of the people we train are corporate executives. We work with companies like Audi and Accenture and a Facebook and Bain Capital in the Air Force and the San Francisco Police Department. So it's a huge swatch of everybody. And um, it's because this stuff works for everybody. It works. You know, it's how we are built biologically to do peak performance. So if you're interested in peak performance, this is what this is what we're doing. Stephen, I, I talk to hundreds of people a month and there is a, a subset of folks i would say they're in their in that at that age of early 30s where things start to become uh redundant and and the the day-to-day -day of that redundant life becomes starts to become absurd and they're looking to shake things up however the hurdle for them to take action and to shake things up seems to be too large of a hurdle for a lot of folks to jump into. Now, there's some folks who are like, I'm ready, let's go, I'm tired of it, I'm at my wit's end. But then there's others who have found themselves who have gotten content. And though they, they want to change their life, they want to make these changes, they want to shake things up, uh, they, they've, they're the chains that they have put themselves in have, have gotten too ungodly for them to get out of. What do we say to those guys or what can we point to? Yeah. I mean, it's the great questions, really, really good questions. And so there's, um, you sort of combined a couple of different archetypes together. So like there's a slightly different answer for people who are burned out than people who are sort of content and a little lazy and a little fearful, you know, that's sort of, there's slightly different answers, Okay, but cause usually if you're coming in with burnout, you have to start, and this is really useful for anybody. You want to just start by like manicuring your nervous system, right? A little bit of emotional regulation. So like anybody who's burned out, you want to start by trying as much as you can to get seven, eight hours of sleep a night, for example, just like baseline. This is the amount of sleep we need. We know hydration, nutrition, that sort of stuff. Um, and you want to lean on basic tools like social support, make sure you have a good social support network and you reach out and you're actually, you know, really based. This is the basic stuff that helps us manicure our nervous system. And then depending on how jacked you are, do one to two to three of the following a day. So if you're a little anxious, right, and a little burnt, you want to do either a gratitude practice, a mindfulness practice or exercise. And it's literally a five minute gratitude practice. And I could talk for the next two hours about the neuroscience of gratitude and why it's important, but let's just, Gratitude practice, mindfulness for stress reduction. You want 11 minutes of like breath work a day. It doesn't have to be super fancy. Um, or I love running a loving kindness meditation because it's a freaking script and you find an online, you know, and you just, I literally just have to run the script and it does the same thing. It's actually better than most other forms of mindfulness or 20 to 40 minutes of exercise, right? You exercise when you're exercising for anxiety, you want to wait for your lungs to open up and to get a little quiet upstairs. That's a sign that the brain has released nitric oxide. It flushes all the stress hormones out of your system. So like what I tell the people is if you're a little um, anxious, a little burnt, do one a day, two a day, you know, or three days. So that's where you sort of want to start really with if you're anyone. That's Those are sort of like the peak performance basics. This is how do you just get in the ring? But the thing I want to emphasize, and this is really the place to start, everybody has what's known as a primary flow activity. For me, it's skiing, meaning like 80, 90% of the time I go skiing, it just drops me into the zone. For my wife, it's hiking with the dogs in the backcountry. For my best friend, it's playing guitar. For another good friend of mine, it's coding. For, you know, jigsaw puzzles, like whatever it is for you, you want to double down on that. Uh, and in fact, the research shows that if you can spend three to four hours a week on a primary flow activity, that might be the single best intervention to start with. And here's the thing, it's it does 
all kinds of stuff. So flow is a focusing skill. So the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So if you're going skiing on Monday, you know, for you, it's your primary flow activity it might mean more flow at work on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We know that the heightened flow massively boosts happiness, well-being, um, overall life satisfaction, those things. And the afterglow flow seems to last a couple of days. The heightened creativity well, it'll last a flow state by a day, maybe two. Um, and when we move into flow, it resets the nervous system towards zero. So it flushes our stress hormones out of our system. And I'd like to mention from a peak performance aging point of view, there are nine known causes of aging. All of them. What do they have in common? Inflammation, stress and inflammation. So anything you can do to combat stress and inflammation is combating aging. And it's, you know, sort of job one. So you get a lot of bang for your buck with your primary flow activity. And the thing about it is, and the reason I wanted to mention it, because you described a certain type of person. And what happens is, as we start to age, whatever, usually around, right around 29, 30, like those, the exact age group you described, you put away childish things. Oh no, I got a family. I got a job. I've got responsibilities. I can't ride my skateboard. I can't ride my surfboard. I'm not going to play my guitar. I, you know, all those things go away and it's the exact opposite of what you need to be doing. Right? Like, so it's very counterintuitive and it's also, I will tell people, I will say everything I'm going to talk about, whether it's this or a handful of other things, they sound, they're not sexy. Right. Like there's nothing really say. I always say nothing I talk about. If you bring it into a bar on Friday night, it's going to get you laid. It's not sexy. <laughs> it's not like bioacting. You're not injecting rhinoceros horn peptides into your testicles. You know, I'm like, none of that shit is happening. And it's not. Um, it's just it's the most deadly effective stuff in the world, period. It's what all the science shows. And everybody wants they either want a shortcut or they want a whiz bang. Where's the app? Where's the technology? You know, and I, I like simple psychological tools that produce powerful neurobiological reactions. So how is that interplay with flow and aging and how is this counterintuitive? Because many of us listening have been taught and told that it's just a slow progression downward and maybe it's 30 for some, maybe it's 40 for some, but it does have that sense and that feeling. And even culturally, it's, it's shared that everything's downhill, right? That's what we tell each other. Yeah, it's, it's funny because... Um, They've done studies. The most common stereotype and acceptable stereotype in the world is ageism. It's universal. It's the number one. It's like the thing. And it's acceptable. It's the one that people don't say, hey, hey you can't you can't say that. You know what I mean? To any of the other stereotypes, you trot them out into polite conversation and you're going to get creamed today. Right. You're going to get canceled. But people are ageist all the time. It's wild. And there's all kinds of stuff about uh, Becca Levy at Yale has done phenomenal research on how detrimental age, bad stereotypes around aging are to society. Really interesting. Let's just start with, uh, before we even go into flow, you can actually summarize peak performance aging in a sentence. All these words mean very specific things. Some are going to be obvious. Some I'll have to define along the way. But here is everything we know in a sentence. If you want to rock to you drop, you have to engage in challenging social and creative activities that demand dynamic, deliberate play and take place in novel outdoor environments. That is, that's peak performance aging in a sentence. That's everything you wanna, you wanna do, period. This was why my NAR style quest was so important. It, it was exactly that. And I can go through each of those and, and why, why you want them. One thing to know, challenging and creative and often social, but definitely challenging and creative. Those are both flow triggers for a, a bunch of different ways. Uh, dynamic, when I said dynamic, deliver, play. Dynamic is just a single word that means you're using all five categories of functional fitness at once. So strength, stamina, agility, flexibility, and balance, right? Because they all fade and we want to train them all at once, right? Deliberate play, we know what deliberate practice is, right? Anders Ericsson, 10,000 hours, and you, you do the same thing over and over, slight incremental advancement which is great for certain kinds of learning and certain kinds of situations and certain kinds of expertise is a good tool to have. But even Anders will tell you, overall, it's not what you want to reach for. And we learn better with deliberate play. And deliberate play is literally repetition without repetition, right? It's repetition with opportunities for a little improvisation. Why? Way more fun, way more neurochemistry, way more feel good, way more learning, way more flow, right? Um, and no shame, no embarrassment, all the stuff that blocks learning, especially in adults, 
Um, and then, so that's dynamic deliberate play, novel outdoor environments. One, we talked about inflammation. We know that time spent in nature lowers stress levels for tons of different reasons, equal to like most SSRIs for antidepressant purposes. So that's really just great in an overall anti-aging perspective. But here's the, here's the coolest thing. You can stave off cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Um, and it's pretty well established by building up what's known as cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve means I'm developing wisdom and expertise. Expertise is essentially everything you're learning consciously. Wisdom is all the unconscious st stuff that comes in along with it kind of thing. That's not really what wisdom is, but it's a shorthand and we'll use it. But expertise and, and wisdom, and if you can get that in novel outdoor environments, it's the best part because our brain evolved as hunter-gatherers to remember where are we when we have emotionally charged experiences? Like where was that ripe fruit tree? Where, where did I get attacked by the bear? All that stuff. So neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons. You want to stave off cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, you need new neurons. Most of the neurogenesis in the adult brain takes place in the hippocampus. Hippocampus does two things. It does long-term memory and it does place and location. It's got grid cells and place cells. So novel outdoor environments, not only novelty is a flow trigger, so you're getting a little more flow, you're also getting all the uh, anxiety, lower stress levels, benefits, the psychological benefits. And finally, there's direct neurological benefits, like you're literally aiding the brain, birthing new neurons, and you're ensuring that the new neural nets that are forming are becoming really robust and resistant to cognitive decline. So. Um, what I like about that sentence and the reason I think it's worth spending five minutes on is, again, it's not what most people think peak performance aging is. Like you talk to 90% of the people, they're going to talk about longevity science or regenerative medicine or biohacking or how I changed my diet or intermittent fasting or supplements. And I'm not saying those are bad tools, but they're fucking weak sauce compared to what I just said. Right. I mean, like literally like you know it's small differences compared to like really big amplifications one of the things you mentioned there that that is intriguing for for us i mean for our show is all about social skills networking uh relationship building and so in the, i think for a lot of people they understand that the physical physical activity is what they need to do and for a lot of our listeners i mean they work out they eat right they're all about that but you also mentioned creative and novel social interaction. So this is, it, and this is really clear. Like this is in all the research. Out of all those things, out of the whole the big sentence, what's maybe the most important part? To actually two things. If you had, if you could maintain strong legs and um, have a robust social life, especially like one that requires you to use your brain in fun new ways. This doesn't have to be intellectual, but it like playful, you know what I mean? Like that sort of thing where there's, cause you want, it's, it's the brain stimulate, like the social stuff, it calms our nervous system way, way down. We know there's psychological safety demands, all that, we could talk for the next five hours about that. Um, but it also challenges the brain in, in novel and interesting, right? Um, people are unpredictable. So the brain wants like novel, challenging, whatever, and like you get more of it. And the other thing, this is really important and this shows up across the boards and people don't talk about it. You have to make replacement friends. Most people know people their age, right? Yes. And as you age older, so I have a dear friend who I work with. He was literally one of the smartest people on the planet during the 20th century made a colossal amount of money, very famous, very well-known, giant thought leader. He is very old. I called him just to check up on him a lot during COVID because he was in New York and I was worried about him and he's very old. And he would say things like, oh, Stephen, it is so great to hear from you. Everybody I know has died. I don't right. know anybody anymore. And the craziest thing about it is like, he comes out of a particular generation of thinkers, like a, a group of like 70s scientists and they think differently. Like if you know, it was, it was a really interesting era in like science and it's a very particular way of thinking. So think about this. Everybody who thinks like him, they're all gone. All of them. He's like the last remaining one and he didn't make replacement friends. And, um, and it's certainly also a peak performance aging. It shows like the societies where people age the best cross generational friendships. It's better for Young people, it's better for old people. Everybody thrives. And 
a society where that exists, you tend to get all the blue zones, right? All the societies where you have really long lived uh, that's one of the things that they are. They have a, one of the, the commonalities is cross generational friendships and sort of respect for all all generations, which is another thing. Also, I have to say this: like I have this great joy of running a company where like the vast majority of everybody who works for me is almost thirty years younger than I am, and that I, amazing, right? Amazing for that. And then I've got a bunch of people who are you know thirty years older than me as well. It's just, it's wonderful because you like, it's, you get kicked out of your fixed thinking. As I was saying, for the folks who are in this self made prison, the replacement friends or creating a robust social life, because I think their, their friends have disappeared. They're, they're, these people may now be married or, uh, they just let their their careers take up much of their lives. And so they hadn't worked on their replacement friends and their friends are getting married and they're having families or they're they're wrapped up in their careers. And all of these folks know that they they need to get back out there. They need to start networking. And they come up with every excuse in the world of why they can't. Just like somebody who may be a bit overweight who could come up with every excuse in the world of why uh, they don't have time for the for the gym. So what I always say with people like that is, okay, man, I hear you, but run the experiment. Yeah. Just run the experiment. I mean, like, the uh, robot, I'm an introvert. I'm a, like, I'm an introvert. I am a writer. I like to spend most of my time alone. My wife and I, like, if we spend, she's an introvert too. She, if we spend a half an hour to 45 minutes a day, sort of like trying to connect. And then I have one phone call with one other friend. That's me for a day. I'm good. But I try to like, I force myself at the end of every work day to make a 10 minute phone call just to somebody in somebody I haven't, usually I'm looking for somebody I haven't talked to in six months, eight months, whatever. I just like, it doesn't even have to be long, but I'm just, and here's the reason everybody has to care. And this is the thing that people don't understand about uh, social support. Whenever you face a problem of any variety, and just to put it in context, we did some studies. Most top executives face five challenges a day that would fall into this category, like the kind of thing that could be a threat, a problem. Right? It's a hard decision. Every time you encounter anything like that, your brain wants to know, you know, how much energy do I need to meet this situation? And the first program it runs is it says, well, do you got backup? Do you have people who love you? Do you have people who are covering your ass? Because if you don't, oh shit, this is a big challenge and we need to produce a lot of energy and give you a big anxiety reaction. And that all that energy is taking energy away from performance. It's ruining the rest of your day, right? Because it's you're stealing energy and stealing willpower. And that big anxious reaction, that's norepinephrine. What does norepinephrine do? It blocks learning. It blocks creativity. It makes us logical, linear. Often it makes us stupid. It wants to reduce choices. I'm scared. I don't want a creative wild solution. Give me something that's safe, that's secure, that works 100% of the time, right? So you're burning tremendous amounts of energy. You're limiting your brain power. And all this is happening because you didn't want to pick up the phone and make a 10 minute phone call or have a good conversation with your partner or friend. Like that's fucking crazy. That's just dumb. That's dumb. It's hard to go on a diet. You know what I mean? Those, those kinds of fixes are freaking hard. I'm saying call a friend. Like the best thing we can do is to call, like, that's a crazy thing to not do. And so what I always tell people is never take my word for anything. Run the fucking experiment in your own life, right? Spend two weeks where you have 10 minutes a day, you're going to reach out and touch someone, preferably in a way that doesn't get you arrested. Thanks for clarifying. And see how you feel at the end of two weeks. See if you're making better decisions. See if you're performing better. See if your relationships are better. If they're worse then this was shitty advice for you and stop, right? And I'm a moron and I apologize. Well, the other thing I just want to add to that is in this show, over the last 16 years, we have given great tools for amazing social interaction, rapport building and networking. Take one of those tools, one of those frameworks, one of those strategies and run the experiment. Have fun with it. Be more efficient and more effective in your communication and your network and relationship building with the people around you and, and run the experiment. And there you go. See how much better you feel. I get the, the excuse I get so much is, oh, I've just been so out of practice. I don't even know how to go about doing it. It's like, pick up the phone. There you go. 
get on a Zoom, run the experiment, take one of these strategies that AJ and I have laid out for years and have some fun with it. There's something great in what you just said also. So I want to pause and say like, the coolest thing here is for the people who have really fallen out of practice with this, because all the research shows you're going to, because you're going to get started in the pro-social neurochemistry. And if you're starved from it, you're going to get the biggest oh, results yeah. Yeah. first, right? And the fun part about it is, and I think this is really core to people. We know how important lifelong learning is. And we've just talked about a whole bunch of stuff around it, but the impediment for a lot of us shame and embarrassment and self-consciousness and we forget how to play right this is one of the things about deliberate play that's so cool one and one of my secrets to park skiing that i sort of started to figure out in the research is we've all heard about the motor learning window that shuts after childhood and you don't become a ballerina in your 30s and you can't learn languages and, and like all these stories there is some biological truth to it but it's only to a point and the whole truth is it's not so much that the brain and the body change. They change a little bit. It's that kids learn by playing. There's no shame. There's no self-consciousness. They're not mad that they're bad. They expect to be bad because they've never done it before and they think it's funny. And as adults, all that stuff, like somehow you think like you're less of a person and if you're bad in public, and I'm the same way. I freaking hate being bad in public, right? I don't <laughs> like it at all. I don't mind being bad, but I don't like being bad in public. So not being out of practice with the social stuff, so cool because you get to, like the only way to make social stuff work as you know is it's gotta be play. If networking is work, then you're that creepy guy at the conference yes. who nobody wants anything to do with, right? Like if, if you're just like a playful, fun person to be around and you're interested in other people, and, and finally, like, what is the secret to a great conversation? All of us read our Dale Carnegie. Listen to the other person and yes. be interested in them as a person. Like, it's not even rocket science. At, and curiosity is a flow trigger, and it's fundamental with so many important things in life that learning how to cultivate curiosity in your conversations with other people is such a potent peak performance tool. What I think strikes this conversation Johnny's having with potential clients, but then also in thinking about your own journey through our country, there is this fallacy, this thought that just go it alone, right? Like, I'm just going to figure this out on my own. I'm just going to brute force it. And what I found in reading the book is so many times you were confronted with fear that probably would have stopped you on your own, but watching your partner, who's even 20 years younger, go pull off that trick, seeing it, realizing that there's a couple missing pieces, but allowing him to come back and conversate with you over the trick that he just pulled or the strategy or what was going through his head allowed you to piece together the path for yourself and take on bigger challenges than you even thought possible on days where you're like, you know what, I'm gonna save this trick or I'm gonna save this path, I'm gonna save this trail for later. And if you had been doing it alone, if you had been on that journey alone, I doubt you would have got to those tricks in the amount of time you did. I can answer that question because oddly, my journey from, so I spent my 20s chasing professional athletes around mountains, okay? Got very injured, ended up sort of like spending my 30s surfing, moved back to the mountains in my 40s and decided I was going to really focus on big mountain skiing. And I went it alone because I was living in New Mexico. I didn't know many people there when I got there. And nobody, like, even after 10, 14 years there, I knew a couple of other skiers. And usually somebody was always hurt. So, like, I would know, like, one other person. And most of the time I was alone. And I can tell you, it, I, I couldn't, couldn't make the progress I wanted to make until I started skiing with other people. I literally couldn't do it. And with, with Ryan, having Ryan as a ski partner – and there were, certain, there were a lot of days when I wanted to be alone. Like I would do something with Ryan and then I'd want to go back to the mountain alone and practice it by myself over and over and over and over again. But no, like, it, the, so one of my cardinal rules was if Ryan can do it, I can do it. Thus I have to, right? And there were caveats. There were ways I, like, there were reason when points at time I said, no, don't do it under these conditions, these conditions, these conditions. And there were a lot of reasons for it, but it was amazing because I got to, one of the things having a ski partner and having these kinds of rules in place for is I knew going in, I needed to make decisions ahead of time because I was going to be doing scary shit. And when you're doing scary shit, you don't make good decisions, right? Too much fear, bad decisions. 
So I had to take decision making as much as of it as I possibly could off the table. I always say that like in the moment, I, I, was, I like to tell people I work for the boss. The boss is the guy who sort of creates the rule book and the playbook and has my best long-term interests at heart because in the moment, I'm like all of us. Give me the easy high. Give me the easy way out. I'm scared. I want to avoid. Like, I'm no different than anybody else. Oh, one of the big differences is I know that I don't get to make those choices in the situation. I've delegated it to a rule book that I'm playing by because it's designed to keep me safe and keep me moving forward. Having a ski partner was great. The other thing that was really cool about having a ski partner is just having that little bit of extra encouragement. You know what I mean? It's one thing to do something great. It's another thing like my ski partner, Ryan's a very reticent kind of quiet, mellow guy, but every now and then he'd see me do something and he'd cheer. And like, this is a guy who never like even raises his voice. I mean, like ever, um, even when like horrible shit goes wrong, he stays dead calm and even. And uh, so hearing him cheer every now and again was like, I could go for like a month on that. (laughs) Yeah, very empowering. And we'll talk about the protocol outside of adventure sports, but I do want to hone in on the initial fear at your age with your injury history. Many people saying you can't even learn this. Why even try? And if you've ever been around park terrain on the mountain, you notice more falls than the successful tricks, (laughs) like falling eating it is the name of the game. And as a big mountain skier, you're trying to avoid eating it as much as possible. So how did you get over that initial hurdle of fear to actually throw yourself into the arena? Because I think that leads many of us to even stay on the sidelines far longer than necessary. There's a couple things you need to know before I can answer that question about flow. Flow states, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow, right? And the most famous of them is the challenge skills balance. Flow follows focus. So it only shows up when all of our attention is in the right here, right now. That's what all the triggers do. There's 26 that are known to science. They all drive attention in the present moment. The most famous is the challenge skills balance. It says we pay the most attention to the task at hand, meaning it has the greatest chance of driving us into flow when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set. If you were to put a number on, and this is not a real number, this is a metaphor. So this is not science. This is just metaphor. It's about 5%, right? When the, when the challenge level is about 5% greater than your skills, that's a sweet spot. Here's the thing that I, he so to answer your question, one, I'm going to tell you what we did on the mountain with park skiing. And two, I, I want to start with the fact that in older adults, there's something called allostatic load. Allostatic load is the sort of physical impact of trauma over time, physical damage to your body, mental damage, whatever. We realized that that because of allostatic load in most people. And sometimes this could show up as early as 30, right? When Johnny earlier was talking about his friends were starting to get really conservative at 30. There's reasons for that neurobiologically why that happens, but that constriction that starts to show up our challenge skills sweet spot, especially for things that we're scared about, like park skiing, it's down to like 1%. So what we realized is with this stuff, you have to go incredibly slowly. So here's what we did just with park skiing and snowboard. And then we can talk about otherwise, but we didn't teach anybody. It wasn't about learning new tricks, right? It was park riding for skiers and snowboarders. There are eight foundational movements. There is a, you have to know how to jump. You have to know how to crouch. You have to know how to slash. You have to know how to grind. You have to know how to, there are a 180, a 360, and a shifty. Those are the foundational movements. Our goal wasn't to teach people how to do tricks. It was to teach them the foundational movements so that they could start with one of those they already knew how to do and could execute with zero fear and no conscious interference and build on that one micro movement at a time. So here's the other thing. Even everybody who's ever been on skis or a snowboard, if you've made it to advanced beginner, you know how to do a hockey stop how to turn your skis or your snowboard sideways that now, if I take a hockey stop and I do it on a slightly on a, on a, on a diagonal, that's a grind or a slash, depending on which way you turn your body into it. So I knew going in myself included, but everybody else, we've all got a basic movement that we can start with because everybody has, you have to know how to do this to get in the gateway of the sport. So start there and build one at a time creativity is a flow trigger, pattern recognition. When you see a small hill, um, you're skiing through, like most people look at the train park and they see like the big jump 
and they don't notice that it's on a roller hill known as a knuckle. And you can do all kinds of tricks on the knuckle without ever leaving the ground. Or there's this, this is just shapes of snow. You can move your body in creative ways. So we wanted to teach people how to use their body in new ways with these foundational motions, because that's creativity and creativity produces pattern recognition and pattern recognition drives dopamine and dopamine drives flow and flow amplifies learning. So it was start with these really basic movements, go one at a time, do something totally safe and don't try to learn tricks. When let the flow state take care of that. Like you'll, you'll do more in the flow, right? Your job is just to creatively interpret terrain features in novel ways and like playful ways. That's the only thing people were aiming for. And we took a lot of shit out of the equation. We played follow the leader games. I would follow Ryan. I would do what he did. We didn't talk. So flow requires the prefrontal cortex to stay quiet, meaning you don't want your ego involved at all. So you don't ever want to talk about yourself. You don't want to talk about world events, like anything that you're scared or whatever. The R rule was we could make each other laugh. We could talk about the skiing or we could shut the fuck up. That was our rule, right? Like those were, <laughs> and when we ran the experiment, that was the rule. And I, and I will say people were shocked by it. And they like, there was some resistance at the beginning and like we were shushing people on the chairlift, but after like two hours of it, everybody, everybody got it. Everybody was like, oh, wow, this is really important. It's the same reason, by the way, why if you're like, you don't want to check social media between tasks if you can avoid it because it like, gets your emotions all stirred up and it'll break your focus and pull you out of flow. It's a bad distractor. You know what I mean? Whereas like two minutes of exercise is probably a little bit better if you just like want to break up the, the task because same reason you want to keep that prefrontal cortex turned off to keep yourself in flow if you can, especially when you're task switching. Understanding initially, we're not looking at it as there's the terrain park. Look at all those crazy tricks. We're relying on basic motions, basic movements that we already have a skill level that's a little bit stretching us, but not 200 plus percent outside of our reality. It also sounds like even in the protocol with you and then this larger group, like there is that group happening where you're also seeing others do it around you that creates a sense of physical safety. You're also seeing others be bad at it. Also, right, it is so much easier to be bad with a group of people than, right, like that's the, that, that's sort of the other thing. It made it way more fun. The group, yeah, thank you for bringing that up because the, I mean, if you notice in our country, it's a real book about applied peak performance, applied peak performance aging, but it's also the most thorough book I've ever written about group flow, the shared collective version of, of a flow state. I mean, I, I talked about group flow a bunch in Stealing Fire. But it's really like the most detail is actually in our country in the new book. And I was shocked by it because I'm an introvert and group flow has always been really hard for me. I don't like that. I don't like that. And what I, I actually got great at group flow over the course of the season. And it was so important to my learning. People prefer. So group flow is everybody's favorite experience on the planet. Like it wins every like we'll take it over drugs. We'll take it over sex. We'll take it over any. We'll take it over flow. It's the shared collective version. And there's evolutionary biological reasons for that. Like that makes a lot of sense, but like it's crack cocaine for the soul. Here's the thing that I think that is most important about group flow for your listeners around the peak performance aging tip. We know we've been talking about for 20 minutes now, the importance of social activity for peak performance aging. I'm really freaking busy and I'm an introvert. If you tell me I have to go, like, if you look at the blue zone data, people will spend six hours a day in social conversation with friends, with family. Like, that's what's common in most blue zones. Are you kidding? Who the <laughs> fuck is like, what? I mean, like, what kind of crack are you smoking? Like, does anybody work in the blue zone, right? Like, and a lot of that is because like, you know, some of the blue zones, they're things like they're sheep herders and they're like walking through the back country historically with their friends all day long and stuff like that. But my point is the reason you want all this pro-social activity is you want the pro-social, you want oxytocin, serotonin, endorphin. That's what you're trying to get. You get all that in flow and you get it really fast and you get it at maximum concentration. So you can use group flow to massively, it's like a peak performance tool for the, it's a, it's a hack for like us for social support. And 
for me as like a busy introvert who like, if you tell me, Hey, Steven, you need really good social support. So you're going to have to go out to like the, the bar three times a week and hang with your friends. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to die without that social support. It's just not happening. Forget about it, folks. Like I, I can't, like, it's just not there. So I had to, but in like skiing with Ryan once or twice a week and getting like full blast neurochemistry plus my like trying to 10 minute phone call every day and a conversation with my wife box checked peak performance aging social needs taken care of um in far less time and on a certain level what i like about using sort of like the group flow the flow thing for that is how do you know if you're getting the right amount of social support for peak performance aging is an interesting question right like how do you have, what's the quality of interaction? Like all those are open questions that nobody's like exactly studied because how would you? And it's going to be different for everybody. But I like with flow and when, when I'm spending time in group flow, I don't have to wonder. Like I know those neurochemicals are there and I can take care of it. Let us also point out that there's another ridiculous side of this, which is like you can get a lot of those same chemicals by petting your dog for 10 minutes, right? <laughs> Let's not sleep on that fact. Like if you don't, if you don't have any friends and like you can pet an animal for five minutes and you get oxytocin flowing, both you and the animal and it's really good for both of you. So, you know, there's not really an excuse. In fact, there's research that shows that people who are really fond of nature can get those pro-social neurochemicals from being with trees. And being actually in the natural world, I had a really long conversation with Paul Zak, who's sort of the god of oxytocin research, about this very question. Like, if you're a nature lover, does time, does nature work as a substitute for people? And it sort of does. That is pretty fascinating. Although, highly, I would be remiss in the work that we do to be recommending our clients spend more time with trees. I always tell people that some of my best friends are trees. <laughs> Makes sense reading to our country. The other part to this obviously in, in learning a skill that is physical in nature at your age on terrain are injuries and the recovery from those injuries. So when we talk about aging, injury is one of the things on everyone's mind. And is this going to be the injury that ends my favorite activity that robs me of something that does create flow in my life? So how did you approach the potential for injury and recovery from injury through this protocol. One, you have to understand that my plan was to get me to in intermediate. I didn't, I wouldn't want to become like Alex. Hall. I don't have to win the Olympics. Intermediate matters because intermediate is the point at which the random shit stops happening and you have a little more control. So but if getting to intermediate dangerous, right? But once I'm at intermediate, I have way more control. And now I have like all these new tools for getting into flow. So there's a little bit of method to my madness. Point A, point B, my undergraduate degree is in, is in create and graduate degree is in writing. I'm trained as a poet. You don't take medical advice from a guy trained as a poet, first and foremost. So you can take peak performance advice, but like I don't, I'm not a doctor, but I'm about to give some medical advice. I will regenerative medicine, which is stem cells, peptides, exosomes, placental matrix, PRP, that whole toolkit. I have been both as a researcher studying it. It's in, I've written about it in four or five of my books. Um, I've been experimenting personally with it. I've broken a bunch of 80 bones, right? Um, and I, so I've been using it myself for 20 some years. I've been studying it for 20 some years and I don't think I'm an expert in it at all. Um, but here's what I, I, I've noticed for myself and this is what I believe is true. Forever, until like five years ago, it wasn't even real. It was just bullshit. It was just make-believe. None of the stuff worked the way anybody wanted it to work. And it wasn't actually real. But five, six years ago, it started to get real for ligaments and tendons. Wasn't really real. And now it's progressed to ligaments, tendons, and bones. If, you, if there's people out there trying to sell you on organ regeneration or a bunch of that like complicated stem cell stuff, maybe, I don't know. Uh, you know what I mean? Like open, like we're, we're getting, we're moving in those directions, but I don't think we're there yet with ligaments and tendons and, and, and sometimes bones, the stuff is ready for prime time. And it's very expensive is the problem. But like five years ago, PRP, platelet rich plasma was 10 to $20,000, unless you were in New Mexico, where there's a weird loophole in the law that allows acupuncturists to do that work. 
um, so you can get it for cheaper. Now, my mom just had it on a shoulder injury and her insurance covered it. So this is what changed, is it about six years? The placental matrix, exosomes, all that, all that stuff. And we can talk more about what those words mean if anybody cares, but it's still like right now, the cost has come down enough that like it's the rough equivalent. I've got a like an $8,000 deductible on my healthcare. So if I wanna go have surgery, that's what it's going to cost me. That's about like most, most people it's somewhere eight to 11,000. That's, and so that's what you're going to pay out of pocket for surgery. That's roughly what you're going to pay uh, regenerative medicine to like fix a shoulder or a knee, or, you know, if you want to fix your back, I fixed my back with, I broken my back and fixed my back with regenerative medicine. Um, You'll spend a lot more. You can do it. You'll spend a lot more and it'll take longer. Now, I, the couple of things, it's still not like, one-stop shopping. You may have to have a bun- or number of rounds of regenerative medicine. You may have to do some physical stuff on top of it. So all of that is true. I'm not saying that injuries aren't real and you aren't wrong. Older adults take longer to heal than young people. That's still biology. We, we're not past that yet. By the way, but the stem cell stuff that is coming over the next three to five years, we may actually get past that stuff. But like, r- my point is we're, we're better at the healing than you expect. My second point is Unless you have bone density issues, and then there are specific things you can do, you're not as fragile as you think you are. You're just not. That would, and you have to get over that idea that like you're suddenly gonna. I mean, if you're over 65, you know what I mean. Like, there's realities. But if you're under a certain age, like you're thinking of yourself as way, way, way more brittle than you. I mean, like. I hit the ground so many times during my experiment and I'm brittle. I mean, I break by the proof is that I've broken freaking everything. Right. And no, I'm not as brittle as I think. And here's the third thing I want to say, because this is true. And this is the most important thing to know if you're going to go with this kind of quest. One of the things that is true is our pain load goes up over time, right? Cause you just too many nicks and cuts. There's ways to reverse it um, in terms of like really good movement protocols and, the best, I think the best thing in the world is Revolution in Motion with Edith House. So if anybody wants to know what to do, Revolution in Motion is the best of the movement protocols in the world. She's absolutely the best person out there. Um, and and that's where I would that's where I would start. But what I have found is that as you get older, and this probably starts to get really real late 30s, 40s, you're gonna wake up and feel bad in the morning, especially if you've been performing athletically. If you're a lifelong athlete, you're used to feeling this way, right? You're used to actually a higher pain load in your body. But if you're not a lifelong athlete, the pain load goes up. You cannot judge what you're physically capable of by how you feel in the morning. What I learned on my NAR country adventure is there were so many days I would wake up and I'd feel like somebody beat me with a baseball bat. I couldn't <laughs> But I, I learned, I was like, you don't judge anything until I've taken a long walk with my dog, like 20 to 30 minutes and done some yoga. And then if I felt better, I would just go to the mountain and I was not trying to learn anything. I was just, it was my minimal workout. I would ski 12 laps. But invariably on days where I kept, would get up and I'd be, you know, beaten up and I'd feel terrible. And then I'd, I'd, I'd walk and I'd feel a little better and stretch and feel a little bit better. I'd go to the mountain, I'd warm up very slowly. But by the like three or four warm up runs in, I would then learn like five new tricks and ski two of the three of the biggest lines of my entire life. And I started to realize that a lot of what we feel, what feels like old is actually performance anxiety. So it's very hard to tell the difference between performance anxiety and the feelings of, of age. They feel th- almost the exact same in our body. So what would often happen is I would wake up thinking, oh God, I'm all beat up. And really it was, I was scared to sort of like go back to the mountain and learn a new trick or something. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was, it was, it was fear. It was stuff like that. And it wasn't real, but there was no way I had to learn that by experimenting with my body. You could have told me this. I wouldn't have believed you, but after, you know what I mean? Like at time after time, it kept happening and happening and happening. The thing that like was so amazing to me, it's not even the tricks that were so amazing to me. It was, I skied 88 days. That's like three months of, right? And I, I was skiing six to eight hours a day. 
and I skied 88 days over, over the course of like a five month season. That's a massive load on a 53 year. Like I didn't think it was even, I didn't think I was going to get to, you know, my 43 was my best previously. My goal was 50. And when I got to 50, I was like, Oh wow, I've got so much time left to keep skiing. Let's, you know, and I, I figured I doubled 43 was my best. So I doubled it. I, I was, my goal was going to be 86. I got to 88. And I could have gone longer, but the snow melted. With that, I'd, I'd love to touch on any other sort of surprising, unexpected perspectives you come out of this journey with. Because obviously you went in with a lot of science. You had a lot of things to plan out and build out a protocol. But what surprised you on the back end of the journey and after writing the book? So I touched on this earlier. The, one of the things that's, that's very shockingly weird is the importance of leg strength for peak performance aging. Um, and not, we're not just talking about preserving physical health, though it's the number one, it's the most important thing for physical health. It's actually cognitive. And you guys are going to like this. They think, they don't really know why. There's tons of data that shows strong legs lead to less Alzheimer's, less dementia, less cognitive decline. Why? All, there's a four or five theories, but the most obvious is you can't walk around. You can't have to have a social life. And if you don't have a social life, right, we talked all about that. So like one, I was sort of shocked by how much strong legs play a role. And they also like in terms of balance and staving off broken bones and, and, and all that stuff, really huge. That, that one, that one really caught me. I will also say I have been shocked by the just the incredible importance of flow in adult development and in successful aging. I'm often very wary of like find it. If I find flow in the middle of a thing that I'm doing, I'm suspicious because I'm like, Stephen, you're biased. This, you're, you're the flow guy. You know what I mean? It was reading like really obscure stuff by Chick Set Me High that most people don't read or stuff that was written back in the 80s and the 90s. And so like really older stuff. Um, but finding out how much work he was doing on a adult development. And I'm like, this is a crazy thing. His last study, like there was a reason we had the conversation we had. They just published a study of his posthumously uh, and it was on flow, proneness. And he wanted to know, does it go away at all in our lifetime? And it literally, you stay as hungry for flow as you always were right up until the end. I mean, it was cool to find out, but like I, I was, was sort of shocked a little bit by that, you know what's the most shocking thing to me is actually the inverse of it is how often we coined a term for it. We called it getting geezered. Getting geezered <laughs> is where somebody it doesn't matter what age they are, but somebody gets there. I'm too old for this shit all over you, right? It's amazing if you start listening for like that's the exact mindset for old. It's like you want it, like that's death. That's like yes. you know what I mean. Like Absolutely. it's literally death, and it's amazing. When you go into the world, so the most shocking period, the most shocking thing that happened along the way is Ryan and I, we kept noticing we were like getting geezered by like younger and younger people. And it kept, so I was looking for, I'm, I don't weigh a lot. So I need very specific kind of park skis that I can bend. And I was looking for new skis. So I was talking to everybody I saw who had skis that I didn't know anything about. I'd ask them questions about it. So we, we parked, we were Kirkwood. This guy and this woman get out of a, the truck next to us and they're younger. Ryan's 34 and they're both like five years younger than he is. So in the late twenties and the guy's skiing a ski, the death wish by moment. And I'd never skiing it. It's supposed to be a great park ski among them. And I was like asking him questions. Hey, is it good for this kind of skiing and this kind of skiing and this kind of skiing, and this kind of skiing. And then I said, Hey, can you use it for nose butters and tail butters and things like that? And he's like, well, I don't know. What, what is that? And I was like, oh, it's park skiing tricks. And his girlfriend gets out of the truck and looks at us and just goes, like, screams it. She's so mad. She's like, we are too old for that shit. What do you think? We're children? And he's like, he's like 28. And, like, Ryan is looking at me. And he's like, oh, my God. And I was like, dude, I told you. It's everywhere. It's crazy. But it's everywhere. If you start noticing like this ageist mindset that people have towards their own life, it's so crippling. I guess the final thing I'm going to say to answer your question is, and this is not my line, this is uh, Ellen Langer, who's one of the, she's sort of the godmother of peak performance aging. She was at Harvard forever. She 
has said over and over for the year, years that aging is as much a mental event as a physical process. And the data is really crazy. And I'll just tell you about one of her studies because it's the most famous. It's maybe I probably ran the weirdest study in peak performance aging anybody's ever run. The second weirdest is, is the what I'm about to tell you, her counterclockwise study. So this is, she does her early work on language priming and how language priming really, really, really impacts perception. And she, she does early work on the mind-body per- connection. So she's really interested in how language priming can impact health and like physical stuff. And she starts to wonder after some early experiments, if aging is like a language priming thing, if what we think of as old is actually like a language, like, et cetera. So she designs this famous experiment known as the counterclockwise experiment. It's 1981. She's at Harvard. She gets 16, 75 to 85 year old men. She drives them three hours north of Boston to a monastery. They've repurposed the monastery. It looks exactly like 1961. All the magazines are from 1961. This is so so wild. They they, they turn back the clock and they divide the groups of people into two groups of eight. One group just talks about 1961. Like, oh, they reminisce. I back then I was blah, blah, blah. The other group has to pretend it's 1961. Right. So they're talking in the present tense, like, oh, shit, Cuban Missile Crisis. What is Kennedy going to do? Like that kind of stuff. And they measure everything you could possibly measure, everything you could possibly measure physically, mentally, whatever. The changes in the group that play acted 20 years younger are so significant. I mean, every measure of health improves. Their hearing improves. Their eyesight improves. Their arthritis goes away. This is after five days. Arthritis goes away so much that they get taller and their fingers got longer. It's crazy. In fact, it was so crazy that nobody believed it was true. So they've rerun the damn experiment like four times. They've made television shows. In it. There's three different television shows where they ran the experiment and filmed it in Europe because nobody believed it. Um, and they just recently, this data isn't, hasn't been released yet, but they just recently uh, reran it like right at the start of COVID, I don't know if they got to finish it because of COVID. So I, they may still be doing it with like every modern biological measure they could, they could, but the results of that have been like, that's like when you talk about aging as a mental event, what she's saying is, is the link between mind and body and aging is so much stronger than you could possibly, possibly imagine. And when the deeper you get into the research, like the counterclockwise study is crazy our my study was crazy but there's like 50 others that are just as fucking weird where you're like are you kidding me like oh my god so again people reach for all these they reach for diet and supplements and going to the doctor and um or the wrong kind of exercise and they're not reaching for the most powerful tools available um so those are the things that were most shocking to me along the way. That study sounds amazing. And and it's so great to hear. Steven, you've been on this show before and we've asked you this. What is your X factor, Steven? What is that unique quality about you that makes you unique? I think if there's anything that makes me unique, and I don't think it's unique to me, but um, I may have, because of certain things that, I, that I've done in my life, I may have learned it earlier. I, and I always point this out to other people. I do not mind spending 10 years on a project. Like if that's how long something, like I don't care. And the reason is this, it's just really simple. And most people just never run this experiment with their own life. The stuff that I am proudest of, the stuff that has the most meaning, the stuff that like, when you come to me and say, Stephen, what, like the fact that I've been married for 17 years, I'm freaking proud of that because do you know how hard that is? Yes. <laughs> like that shit ain't easy. It took me 10 years to go. I was a I was 119 pounds when I graduated from high school and the same height I am now. It took me 10 years in the gym till I had a, like a body that could actually perform as an athlete the way I wanted to because I was started so far beyond the curve. My first book took 11 years. I threw out 400 pages four different times. So I got this really great, and I and, I, and as a kid, I was a professional magician. And to learn some of the great tricks, you would have to practice. I had tiny hands. I still have tiny hands. So I would have to practice twice or three times harder and longer than anybody else to learn any trick. 
and to get like the good ones. You know, there was a saying in professional magic that I think when I learned it as a really little kid, which is anything's easy with 10 years practice. And it stuck with me. I don't get dis discouraged is I'm not going to wake up and do the thing that I'm trying to do. I don't, I'm unattached to outcome. I just show up and I do the work. And if it, is it today a good day, a bad, like I don't, none of that matters because as long as I show up and do the work 10 years from now, that box is checked. And I like that to me, like if there's any, it's anything, it's, I'm not afraid of the long-term project because I realize that that's the stuff that really makes life wonderful. And I, I will, a final statement on this, Stuart Brand, who I know people have trouble with some of his stuff today, but I do think he's just a brilliant polymath. And he once said something that I love, which is the only sustainable happiness is the satisfaction of a job well done or the satisfaction of a hard job well done. And his words are very, the only sustainable happiness. And I think that's actually very true. I don't like one of the lessons about peak performance aging is of course, life doesn't get easier. We keep thinking it's going to get easier. You think, keep thinking, oh, I'm getting it, but it, it never gets easier. It is hard from start to go. It's hard here. Planet Earth is hard and it's hard for everybody. Nobody has an easy time and it's hard most days. The only thing that changes is not, happiness isn't going to change. Your happiness levels are basically your happiness levels, but life satisfaction and meaning grows spectacularly. And that's the stuff that makes the hardness Worth it. worthwhile. And that's, the, you only get the life satisfaction, the meaning and that stuff through these long, I worked really hard, right? Nobody, if I, nobody, if you ask them, like, what was the most important thing that ever, nobody says, oh, I got lucky and won the lottery. Even if you talk to lottery winners, they don't talk about that. They talk about this, you know, no, it was the five years I had to drive a cab in New York City to pay my way through film school, like, so I could make, you know, it's those stories that you hear again and again and again. We don't actually like easy. We just think we like easy. I agree. Thank you for joining us again. Where can our audience find out more about the protocol in our country and the work you do? On this one, you at, go to the website for the book, which WW NAR is G N A R chart for gnarly. Yeah. Action sports time, right? G N A R country.com. And the reason you should go there is um, one, if you don't know what park skiing is, and you want to read the book. There's a really fun introduction to park skiing video. That's really funny Two, the peak performance aging experiment, which I've been blabbing about. We videotape the white papers there, but we also we we filmed everything. It's how we judge progress. The athletes we filmed everything, so you can watch. We had a great National Geographic filmmaker following us around during the experiment. So like, there's a great five minute, seven minute, I don't know how long it is, um, peak performance aging experiment video that is super funny. I'm really proud of that video because the thing that. Uh, nobody knows is there's a guy in at the end. He says, my name is Rick Wicks and I'm 68 years old. And I definitely caught some air in the Nara country program. And I thought that was pretty good for an old guy. What nobody knows is that same dude in our foundational program. Like we had a meeting, a zoom meeting, right? Every, everybody. And he was the most, I mean, they were all skeptical, but he was, he was like, I'm 60 years old. I've been skiing for 50 years. I've never left the ground in my life. I'm not going to not safe. I'll never do this. You're out of your mind, but I'll still take part in the experiment. Just cut. And we were like, okay, man, like whatever. <laughs> it's fine. You don't have to like, and so like, I'm really, I, I hear him say that. And I'm like, yeah, we got you. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Steven. It was great having you back. Hey, man, my pleasure, gentlemen. It was so good to see you again. Thank you for the interest in my work. I appreciate both.